Now, we're turning this morning, please, to the book of the Revelation. And we're turning this morning to Revelation chapter number 1, please. The book of the Revelation, and we're in chapter number 1. We're right to the very last book of the Bible, and we're turning to the first chapter. The book of the Revelation, please, and come with me to chapter number 1, and commencing to read from verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every knee shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail be because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, also, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write. Write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I and I turned to see, and the voice that spake with me in being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps, and with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were like his wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as of the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And we end there this morning, and we know that the Lord will bless the reading of His own precious truth. And Tuesday morning, as we journey through the Bible, those who are going through the journey through the Bible with us, you remember it was on Tuesday morning when we came to the first chapter 
of the book of the Revelation. And as we came to the first chapter of the book of the Revelation, and as I was reading this in my own quiet time, the Lord showed me for the very first time a bunch of keys that are here in the very first chapter of this great book of the Revelation. And each key is very unique as far as coming to this wonderful book of the Revelation this morning because we have to use them very carefully. And if we use them very carefully, they unlock each door that brings us into the great mysteries that the book of the Revelation holds for us. The first key we come to, of course, is the key of identification, because in verse 1 we read that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not the revelation of the Apostle John. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. These are the very, this is the very revelation this morning that comes from the very greatest of greater of all, and that's the Lord Jesus. And there's the key of identification. Then there's the key of revelation, because this whole book this morning, in the very first verse, shows us that here in this book we can see things which must shortly come to pass. And if you want to know tomorrow's news, and if you want to know what the news is for the world, in days to come it's all found in the book of the Revelation. I don't need the Belfast Telegraph. I don't need Google. I don't need ATM. I don't need UTV Live because I have it all here. And I know exactly word for word what's coming upon this world. And God bless God, help this world in days to come. And God help you this morning if you're not saved because of the Lord was to come this morning. Remember the Lord will come and is coming. And He's here to take, will come to take every believer out of this world. And if you're not saved this morning and you're left behind, then you'll never be saved. You've missed your opportunity. And then you've got the, you've got the key of preservation, very important. Blessed is he that, verse 3, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And then you've got the key uh, verse number 7, the key of jubilation. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Glory to God, what a moment that will be. Look how it ends. Even so, amen. And then there's the key, verse 8, of glorification. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Verse 10, there's the key of inspiration. I was in the Spirit of the Lord's day and, behi and heard behind me a great voice as of a great trumpet. But I've omitted one, and we're just going to speak on this one key this morning. And it's found in verse 5 and 6, and it's the key of adoration adoration. Verse 5, let's go to halfway through verse 5 this morning. If John says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's our text this morning. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I wonder this morning as you come to our morning worship in Kilkeel Baptist Tabernacle, can I ask you a wee question this morning just before I go any further? Have you come exercised of heart? You mean to say to me, George, what do you mean have I come exercised of heart. What do you mean when you say that? Well, tell me this. Before you come out this morning, tell me this. Did you get alone with the Lord? Did you open your Bible this morning? Did you settle your heart down and say, Lord, will you prepare my heart for worship? How I should come out this morning and how I should worship you aright. Lord, will you prepare my heart? Because you see, in Matthew's gospel, chapter number two, we read about the wise men. And you remember when they came to the palace of Herod, they said to Herod, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have come, what? To worship him. But there's something about the wise men we would need to watch this morning and we need to take from this morning because it's vitally important. 
You know, the wise men, when they were coming, when they saw his star in the east, mind you, they just didn't jump onto the camels and try and find him. When they saw his star in the east, they exercised their heart in an order how we should worship him whenever we find him. And when they exercised of heart, they carefully brought their gifts together, their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And after being exercised of heart, then they went to worship him. And you see, brethren and sisters, this morning, how we are exercised for worship. Let me put this very carefully this morning because this is important. How we have exercised our hearts for worship will determine how we will express our worship. Let me repeat that this morning. How we exercise our hearts for worship will determine as to how we will express our worship. The Lord Jesus in John 4 verse 24 said, He says, God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And therefore, brethren and sisters, this morning we are summoned to present our bodies. We are summoned to present our emotions. We are summoned to present our spirits. We are summoned to present our minds in every biblical form of expression as He would graciously teach us. You see, child of God, it's the same with myself. If I am to get messages for you and to bring to you from the Lord to feed your heart, listen, it's not about just writing down something that I feel needs to be. I have to wait on the Lord. I have to exercise my heart this morning. When I come to the Lord's Day mornings or whatever message or the Lord's Day evening, I have to sit and wait and Wait for the, and exercise my own heart, you know. And every, before I even think of a text, my prayer is, Lord, Lord, sanctify my mind. Sanctify my heart. Sanctify my soul. Sanctify my inner ear, my spiritual ear. Lord, that I may hear what you have to say. Because you see, if I just came with some messages, you'd soon catch on that these messages are not of the Lord. And you know, I have to get before the Lord every week and exercise my own heart so that the Lord, so that I'm open to the Lord as to what He would have to say to you and to me. I'm going to, I'm going to ask a wee question now, another wee question. For those of us who stay at the Lord's table, tell me. You ever ask yourself the question, why is there long pauses while we wait on somebody to give thanks for the bread and the wine? You ever ask yourself that question? Why are we waiting and waiting and waiting for somebody just to give a wee word of thanks? And listen, it's in every church, believe you me. Why is it? You know why it is? The answer is simple. We haven't exercised our hearts to come. Do you know there was a day? Pete men had to really jump in quick to get in to give thanks because they came with prepared hearts. Listen, this is something the Lord is laying on my heart to say. If you come exercise this morning, listen. How long did you spend with your Bible this morning? How long did you spend with your Bible last night? reading Luke 23, reading Matthew 27, reading the gospel account of Calvary, preparing your heart for the Lord's table, and, and you were so exercised, you say to yourself, Lord, I'm going to thank you at the Lord's table, the more, your table in the morning, morning. I'm going to thank you for the bread, and if I don't get in in time with the bread, Lord, I want to thank you for the wine that speaks of your blood. Tell me this morning, see the exercise of heart? Listen, that's your decision. It's your choice. And friend, this morning, how have we exercised our hearts as we have come to worship Him this morning? I want you to notice, first of all, the person that John adored. 
I want you to notice, unto him. You know, there's nobody out of the 12 disciples, perhaps, that, 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 that knew John any better than, than John. You remember at the Last Supper, it was John that leaned upon the Lord's bosom. And you remember in its time and its humanity, well, John knew that intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. He had that intimate knowledge. He lived close to the Lord. And child of God, this morning, do you live close to the Lord? You see, to love Him is to know Him. How well do you know the Lord this morning? To love Him is to know Him. And Pastor Eddie Ray, the late Pastor Eddie Ray, was pastor in Shankill Baptist. I remember him telling the story that a, a young brother who had just recently got saved came to him and said, Pastor, can you show me how to love the Lord Jesus more? I want to love him more, Pastor. Can you show me? And Eddie brought him into the vestry and he says, Listen, if you want to love him more, you've got to know him more. Not true. To know Him is to really love Him. Brethren and sisters, you can't get close to the Lord. You can't really know the Lord and not love Him this morning. The closer we come to Him, the more compassionate we'll be. Ah, oh, look, 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 look at verse 5 this morning. The person John adores. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 8, the Lord Jesus. I wonder how many of us, myself included, and put my own hand up here, I'm pointing to myself. I wonder how many of us this morning, including myself, the Lord would have to say, This people draweth nigh unto me with their, with their mouths. And with their lips they, they honor me, but their heart is far removed from me. Where's your heart this morning, child of God? How close is it? How close? You know, this morning, when we go to the book of the Revelation, in the very next chapter, we read what the Lord Jesus had to say about the church at Ephesus. And mind you, there was so much, friend, that he had to commend concerning the church of Ephesus. They were doing everything right, everything right. Outwardly looking at that church, everything was perfect. Dotted the A's, crossed the T's, everything was done traditionally right. But there was something that the Lord had against that church. Do you know what it was? They had left their first love. They didn't lose their first love. They left it. They left it. I wonder many times, child of God, we, yes, we, myself included, we've left our first love, you know. I just maybe don't love them the way we, we once did. Tell me, is this you this morning? After the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the first question Peter was asked by the Lord Jesus, lovest thou me? You see, to love him is to know him, and to really know him is to really adore him. Have you come to this service this morning to worship Him? Have you come to adore Him? Have you come this morning to praise Him? Friend, you know what we all need to do? We all need to get taken up with the Lord. We all this morning, myself included, needs that fresh encounter with the risen, exalted, glorified Lord Jesus. That's what we need. The person that John adores. So oh, come, let us adore him this morning. Then I want you to notice the passion that John adores. He says unto him, look at the three words, that loved us. There's one thing, child of God, you and I will never deny. 
And there's one thing that nobody will ever deny this morning or could deny are those three words that loved us. No child of God, it's good to get back to the cross. It's good to get back to Calvary. It's good to see how He loved us. Listen to this one unconditionally. In spite of who we were, in spite of what we've done, friend, He loved us. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God commended His love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You can say that backwards, you know. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And God commended His love toward us. He loved us unconditionally. When there was nothing within us to love, you know, when I look back to my own life, and I see the person that I was, things that I did before I got saved, and maybe this morning you're sitting in this meeting and you weren't into the level of sin that I was. But listen, friend, even when I was in my sin, He didn't love me any less than He loved you. Unto Him that loved us. Oh, child of God, how could we not adore Him this morning when we see how He loved us? Oh, friend, when you think of years after the crucifixion, maybe a number of soldiers gathered together and, uh, and they're reminiscing about old times. You know, you get to a certain age, you start reminiscing. I've started already. And do you remember way back then? Do you remember that way back then? Do you remember then we, we crucified that man? Do you remember that man we did? His name was the Lord Jesus. Yes, do you remember that place? I remember that well. Do you know what I've soon discovered? We crucified him that loved us. He loved us. Maybe the man that scourged them. Ah, we, he it was. He it was that loved us. Maybe the man that spat in his face. The years that come, that turned around and says, you know, he it was that we spat on whose face. He it was that, that loved us. Maybe it was the Romans that put their nails through his hands and feet. Do you remember, remember, big fella, when you were hammering the nails through, remember what he said? Do you remember what he prayed? He prayed, Father, forgive them. We never heard the like of that coming from anybody before that were put to the cross, but he prayed, Father, forgive them. Do you know something? He it was that loved us. I was reading a testimony the other day of a man called Mark Fitzpatrick. And Mark was a Republican supporter. He was on his way to a, a Sinn Féin meeting in Oma. But by the way, this testimony is public on Facebook. And he happened to call into a friend's house on his way to Oma to celebrate the fourth anniversary of Bobby Sands' death. And in that home there was another neighbor, and the other neighbor didn't know who, who, who this man was. And the talk came around about God, and this wee man opened up about God. He was a Christian fellow. And this man began to speak to the two men about the love of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus. And he began to explain to the two men of how much he loved them, in spite of who they were. He actually went on to explain the way I would explain it. He says, listen, you boys, in God's sight, there's no such thing as orange and green or anything up there. He says, wait till I tell you, he loved you as much as he loved me, and your need is in him, and that's why he died for you. And Mark sat in that house, we read in his testimony, and the very love of the Lord Jesus broke his heart sitting in that home on his way to Yuma to a Sinn Féin meeting. The love of God broke his heart and he gave his life to the Lord and he never went next or near the meeting and he turned his back and all of that kind of life that he lived. Praise God. You know, the love of the Lord Jesus is the message that the world needs to hear today, brethren and sisters. It's still the answer. How could we not adore him? 
Brethren and sisters this morning, child of God, how could we not adore him unto him that loved us? Look to the cross this morning. He loved us not only unconditionally, he loved us this morning undoubtedly. You can't doubt it, never mind the night. Paul, the chief of sinners, said, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Tell me this. When was the last time his love touched your heart? When was the last time you wept when you think of what Christ done for you on the cross? When was the last time your heart was touched when you think of how he loved you? Oh, we say we're Christians and we say this and I'm not saying anything. And we say we're evangelical. I told you, I think before I was, I was preaching in a church one day where three men that belonged to they used to minister in song around the country. They're no longer doing it. And they used to sing a song called Calvary Means Everything to Me. And it was lovely pieces. It was a lovely piece. In fact, the first time I heard it, the very hairs I used to have hair then in the back of my neck used to stop. It was, it was so great. Oh, it was so magnetic. And I remember speaking to the pastor. He says, what were the, them three fellows the, the uh, they used to come here, they come here still. I just might remember hearing them singing a song, Calvary means everything to me. And he says, boys, what a blessing it was. And the pastor went, huh? And he says, what do you mean, huh? He says, them three men who sing around the country, Calvary means everything to me. He says, they're never once at the Lord's table. When was the last thing? Do you know Robert Murray McShane? Young Robert Murray McShane made it, made it his, his exercise every morning to go into that quiet place, open up the Bible to Isaiah 53, put his elbows on the table, and look and read over it and read over it and cry for hours as he thought what the Lord done for him. Tell me, brother and sister, this morning, when was the last time we wept? Friend, when was the last time our hearts broke when we think of him that loved us so much that he gave his very sinless life for us? The passion that John adores unto him that loved us Look at the pardon John adores and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Ah, oh, child of God, should this not give us real cause to come out this morning and worship him and adore him? What mercy, brethren and sisters, what mercy it was that he should wash us from our very sins in his own blood. And you look back, child of God, as I often do to a day when I wasn't saved, guilty was ruled over the whole lot of us. Was. And to think this morning, you and I are spotless in His sight because He has washed us from our sins in His own blood. Ah, child of God, this morning, do I not adore Him? With every reason to. A Iranian man was being hung for the stabbing and for the killing of, a, of an 18-year-old. And according to the Sherry law, the parents, the parents were allowed to take part in the execution. They got this man up onto the chair and they put a noose around his neck. The man stood back and signaled to the mother, you can come and kick the chair from under him. You commit the execution if you want to. She signaled that she did. And she went over to the chair and she looked up. And she called for another chair. Another chair was brought And she got up onto the other chair. You know what she did? 
She leaned over to the condemned man and reached for the rope and loosened the noose and took the noose of his neck, removed the blindfold from his eyes and took him by the hand brought him down and to the laws and the authorities she says this I pardon him he is not to die and the story reads as the crowd were chanting for his blood. The same crowd broke into floods of tears as they watched the mercy and the love of a mother shown to a man that killed her very child. You and I, child of God, are that man. You and I were condemned. The judgment of God was on our heads. But Christ died for us. He died in our stead, and through the shedding of his blood, this morning we are free. And we're free forever because he hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. Should that not give us every reason to adore him? Yes, it should. The person, John Adore. The passion, John Adore. The pardon, John Adore. I'm going to finish with this one. The position that John adores and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. We're going to tell you, child of God, we're no ordinary five eights on this planet. We're not ordinary five eights, you know. We're kings and priests unto God this morning. Do you know we're more important than Donald Trump? We are more important than the British Prime Minister. We are kings and priests unto God and unto his Father. You know, I remember my former pastor, Ivan Thompson. You've heard me referring to him a number of times. He used to deliver for Hodges. And he went to this house in the Cherry Valley in Belfast, well, the do area of Belfast, and he was delivering this piece of furniture into this dining room. And the dining room was lovely. The carpet was, oh, it made about an inch thick. And, there, and uh, they carried this piece of furniture in, set it down. Ivan says, bring in my lunchbox. He says, it's, it's, it's tea time. And Ivan sat down and said, tea, start having his lunch. And the wee lady come in with a face like thunder. She says, excuse me, excuse me, this room, this room is not for you, Eden. He says, this room, this room is for, for important people. And Ivan looked up at her. She says, don't you let the shop coat fool you? He says, not important. He says, do you not know who I am? He says, who are you? He says, did you not know I'm an ambassador? I wear that way, she says. And he took out his wee Bible. He used to carry a wee Bible in his work pocket. And he opened it up at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. Just me to see this, dear. That's me there. For we are ambassadors for Christ. He says, I'm an ambassador for the King of Kings and the Lord of Love. Lord of Lords. You know what he said? She said to him, Would you like sugar and milk? <laughs> oh, I loved the way he used to answer people. Oh, he had the art, you know. He had the art. He says, I, you know who I am. I'm an ambassador for the king. You know, listen, listen. We this morning, because of him, were heirs of God. And we are joint heirs with Christ. I remember the day my father got the 
MBE. We were dropped off in a taxi at the gate of Buckingham Palace. And of course, the crowds were all around. We had to make our way through the crowd. Oh, you felt, oh, you felt 10 foot tall. And uh, my mother and my father and I walked across that front of that forecourt of Buckingham Palace. Oh, we were like the royal family. Mummy says to me, you know, that gravel would be sore in the heels of your shoes, wouldn't it? And I said to myself, never mind. I might be walking on, on the royal on the royal gravel. Glory to God, I'll be walking on the royal gold someday. I'll be walking on the royal gold. You know why? Because I'll tell you why. Because I'm a citizen of heaven. Brethren and sisters, we're citizens of heaven this morning. Listen, we're not members of the royal family on earth. We're members of the royal family in heaven. We're not ordinary. We're not ordinary five at all. Doesn't matter what you work at. I'm a king, and I'm a priest unto God and the Father. Isn't that wonderful this morning what we really are? Listen, let's come this morning. Let's adore Him. Let's adore Him for His person this morning. Let's adore Him for His passion, His pardon, His position. And this morning to think of it, that we are robed. We are robed in the royal garb of His righteousness. Oh, is he not worthy of all our praise? Of course he is. Is he not worthy of all our worship? Of course he is. He is worthy of all our praise. And John says unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Listen to this bit. To him. Be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Are you glad you saved this morning? Yeah. Good man. I'll say it again. Are you glad I was saved this morning? Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Now you go out of here. Now don't you think you're just so and so? <laughs> Not at all. You're a king. And you're a priest. Yes, you're a priest. Unto God. And the Father, thank God for what He has done for us and what He has made us into. Amen? Amen. Amen.